uh, judge the Congress? How do you view their sort of role in this election? They're headed by young Rahul Gandhi. Uh, do you think Congress and BJP here seem very imbalanced? Well, I think young Rahul Gandhi is, a, is an admirable young politician, uh, but he would have stood a better chance had, had he come in after a period of BJP rule uh, as leader of the opposition. Now, that's probably the plan. I mean, he will run this time, even if he loses, he will then take over the party and be ready uh, to become prime minister after that. But uh, his problem now is that he's coming in at the tail end, or what might be the tail end, of uh, a Congress administration. So there is an in anti-incumbency factor. Mr. Manmohan Singh is, uh, is suffering from a public perception that, however educated he is, uh, he is just... Uh, well, basically, uh, a glorified puppet or retainer of uh, of the Gandhi family, uh, and and people don't they expect an educated man to show more backbone uh, uh, and not be just seen as a hired uh, or an appointed uh, representative of a of a family. Now, Mr. Rahul Gandhi suffers from the fact that he will be coming in as part of an incumbent administration. Uh, that's that's never very smart. Uh, if you take an equivalent of the Badranayakas here, they were always much smarter. Uh, Chandrika came in after a long period of UNP rule, and having toppled her mother, uh, came in as somebody who had been a, something of a dissident. I mean, she had broken away, founded a party with Vijay Kumar Tunga, so that was a change element. But if you are all in one bunch and then you come in at the end of many years of rule, then however good a, a young candidate you are, uh, you, you just suffer by comparison. Mr. Modi is an interesting guy because he's uh, he started off uh, from very humble beginnings, uh, a small job. Uh, he's not, uh, you know, uh, formally very well educated. He's supposed to be a brilliant speaker. Uh, he is a Hindu nationalist and he's proud of it, uh, which is not usual in in the norm, as the, given the norms of Indian politics. He has been very successful as the chief minister in economic terms in Gujarat and in a Hindu society which uh, in which caste play, plays a bigger role than it does in Buddhism uh, certainly it has no place in Buddhism proper um, Mr. Modi comes from a so-called uh, low or oppressed or depressed caste he's not from uh, the so-called upper caste in a in a Brahminic or Hindu society, but he's done remarkably well, and the Indian people seem to be shifting towards him. He seems to have caught a mood or generated a mood, and the momentum does seem to be with the BJP. Uh, Sri Lanka's problem will be that Ms. Jalalita will be very much part of that BJP uh, governing bloc. We see vibrant politics taking place in India. Uh, uh, could you say the same for Sri Lanka? We have uh, the government, we have an opposition which uh, finds it difficult to stand up to the sort of power and strength as the government does. We saw recently, just last weekend, the party convention was held and we saw all UMPs coming in. They're the largest uh, party, the largest opposition party uh, coming in, gathering together uh, for the party convention. What were your thoughts, uh, Doctor, when you saw uh, what transpired at the party convention or what came out of the party convention? Well, uh, next year is an important uh, electoral year, uh, not only Geneva but also the provincial council elections. And it is said that the provincial council elections are being timed with an eye to Geneva, either just after or just before. What does this tell us? That tells us that external and internal politics are much closer linked than ever before. Now. Uh, you asked me about the UNP convention. I think the UNP convention um, put to rest this whole issue of the leadership council because you saw very clearly on television that Mr. Vikram Singh was, was very much the leader of the party. Uh, he actually got people to stand up and sit down. I've never seen that done before. I mean, not even in school. Normally you put your hand up. Um, so they even had a song called Ape Ranil. It was not Ape Leadership Council or Ape Karuja Surya. It was Ape Ranil, meaning I mean he's still very much the party leader. It was very visible throughout. Um, but there are uh, three things that disturbed me. One was that gesture of uh, 
asking people to get up and sit down. That shows a lack of respect for people. I've never seen a political leader, including the present president, uh, doing that uh, at a party convention or anywhere. They just say, please, raise your hands if you are in agreement. You don't, these are not Montessori children. If that's the way you treat your party, uh, how would you not treat your citizens? This is one thing that disturbed me. The other thing that distressed me even more was uh, the fact that the national anthem was interrupted by uh, the party's national leader. Uh, you don't do that, you don't interrupt the national anthem and say something and then say, okay, resume the national anthem. Uh, I mean, what kind of conduct is this? But worst of all, was something that I cannot in fact repeat in this studio, certainly not with a lady. Um, and that is, uh, Mr. Vikram Singer said something, not to his neighbor, not caught by a live camera, but in his speech. He said something that was uh, uh, utterly obscene. Now, if that obscenity had been uttered by any uh, child or school kid, uh, uh, a liberal parent would have given him a lecture, a less liberal parent would have given him a slap. But now it won't be possible to do that because he, uh, the schoolboy could always say, um, I learned it from the leader of the opposition speech. And normally you learn it from the worst child in class, that sort of thing. So when you have the aspirant leader of the country uh, uttering obscenities in, in his speech, which he knows would go into the drawing rooms of people. Uh, I think that the, the rot has really not just set in, there's very little left. If that is the way the leadership of the party, the leader of the party behaves, if that is the way uh, uh, that if, if the party is such that it continues to retain and hail such a person as the leader, uh, I really don't think that there's uh, uh, a great deal of optimism concerning the electoral performance this year. Uh, they need to avoid, just as the government has to listen to what Mr. Akash has said, I think the UNP has to avoid uh, a fate which uh, I would call 2020, that is 20 years in opposition next year in 2014 and down to 20% of the vote. Uh, that's the way it's looking to me right now. Well, I'm afraid we've come to the end of the show, but Doctor, if I can briefly ask you to recap this entire year in, in a short um, sort of overlook at how the political situation was, how politics was, how current affairs in Sri Lanka was, the country's situation during 2013. How would you sum up all of that? Well, one, it has been the year of the holding of the Northern Provincial Council election and uh, a splendid victory by the TNA. So it called into question the entire model of the government's post-war uh, policy. Uh, two, it has been a year of international challenges, a defeat in Geneva in, uh, in this year. Um, so uh, there again you have uh, the signal of the crisis of the government's post-war model, this time in external relations. Three, the popularity of uh, the incumbent, President Rajapaksa, remains uh, as high as before. You could see that uh, in the results of the Provincial Council elections this year. Um, for the chairpersonship of Chogam and the controversy surrounding that, so uh, you had a plus for the government but also a big minus. Uh, five, David Cameron's uh, uh, political theatre and grandstanding, which did send uh, a seriously destabilizing signal to the Tamil people and was not very helpful for the stability of Sri Lanka. Um, those uh, were, th were the main uh, features and next year uh, I would say, oh, oh, no let me summarize, this year if you have to, if I had to identify one as the most important thing that happened this year, I would say is the Northern Provincial Council election. And if I have to identify the single most important thing that's on the calendar for next year, it's Geneva, March 2014. That's the way I see uh, this year that's ending and the year uh, in prospect. Mahina. Well, I hope it would be a prosperous year for Sri Lanka and also to you, Doctor. Thank you very much for joining us on Th this program. Thank Wishing you, you a very happy new year and a great year ahead. I wish you and, and our viewers the same.
Yes, for everyone back at home, hope you have a blessed and peaceful new year. And also for the country, let's hope that it is in for some good times. Um, obviously, you can't really rule out bad times. Every uh, good thing would always have uh, a bad uh, thing in its hand as well. It's like a two-faced coin, Doctor. It depends on where you flip it. It also depends on luck, but it also depends on the people and the courage of the people and also about the thinking of the people and the country. We'll join you again next year. It's going to be a brand new year, a lot to talk about. So we'll see you again in 2014. Have yourself a great evening. Good night.